kind invitation to, to, to come and join you. And I'm sorry, sorry I can't be there in person. person. Um, and I'm going to talk today about management of immunotoxicity in patients receiving CAR T cell therapy. And this is a really important aspect of, of management, as we all know. These are my disclosures. Now, essentially, um, we want to start the talk um, briefly by talking about cytokine release syndrome. And I think most people in the room will be familiar with this syndrome. Um, also with the, the presentation and grading. But as a sort of a quick recap, um, it's essentially uh, defined by a fever of over 38 degrees um, in conjunction with hemodynamic instability and hypoxemia. And the severity is graded by a very helpful AST-CT consensus guideline and the um, outline of the parameters are listed in this table. I mean, it's pretty common. We see it in anywhere between 30 and 100% of our patients, although more severe Phenotypes are less commonly observed. And of course, the incidence depends a little bit on some of the factors such as CAR T cell product use, disease characteristics, and so on. Um, and it's very important for us to be aware that the differential diagnosis here is always neutropenic sepsis. And our default should be to give IV antibiotics in this context. And so in terms of the management of CRS, again, sort of mainstays of therapy include antipyretics and fluids and tocilizumab, as we know, interfering with the IL-6 signaling pathway um, has been sort of pivotal in terms of controlling this syndrome. And of course, we have to consider corticosteroids, particularly in the context of tocilizumab refractory cases. And we define that when a patient hasn't responded to two um, sequential doses. We feel that instituting dexamethasone is appropriate at that point. And of course, with plans for a rapid taper, given the burden of infectious complications that we see with the use of corticosteroids in these patients. Now, in terms of when should one use tocilizumab, we tend to use it earlier in older and comorbid patients. And again, we're always mindful of the fact that it does increase the risk of infection. Um, so occult sepsis should be considered. And there are very rare cases of GI perforation. And of course, if we have a CRS syndrome that doesn't respond to our conventional tools in the, ar the arsenal, then we have to consider alternatives. And we've mentioned sepsis, but also we need to think about macrophage activation syndrome or IEC HLH. And so if we look a little bit into sort of HLH or immune effector cell associated um, HLH, well, what this really defines pathologically is a sort of a hyperinflammation. It's an uncontrolled macrophage activation. And there's lots of different um, underlying causes for this, but CAR-T has been recognized to be a big driver of this syndrome. And the kind of um, symptoms and signs that we're looking for include persistent fever despite CRS management, a high ferritin of above 10,000 nanograms per mil, prolonged cytopenias, hypertriglyceridemia, and of course, coagulopathy and so on. Now, it tends to be associated with severe CRS in CD19 cars, but of course, we've also seen it with other cars, including CD22 cars um, and BCMA cars. So we should keep an open mind for it, irrespective of the product that we are using. And in terms of the clinical management, this is a, sort of a really nice algorithm just to outline how, how to find it and maybe what we should do to manage it. And of course, um, frequent intervention, frequent blood tests, and a Kinra blocking the IL-1 signaling pathway with recombinant humanized um, drug is, is, has been pivotal and instrumental in managing this syndrome. And of course, we often use that in, in conjunction with corticosteroids. When the combination of these therapies doesn't control the syndrome, um, you know, we have to be a little bit more mindful that um, this is a sort of a very high risk situation. And in some um, circumstances, investigators and clinicians have used chemotherapy to try to intervene in this clinical um, scenario. But there's very little published data to guide us as to what is the appropriate next step in those refractory cases. Now, in terms of um, ICANs, again, it's something a lot of us in the room will be familiar with. We've treated it ourselves. Um, it affects a large proportion of our patients, somewhere between 20 to 60 percent of our CD19 CAR T patients. And it onsets usually sequentially after the CRS between three and five days post CAR T. And it's severe in around about 30 percent of patients. And again, we use this hugely helpful ASTCT scoring uh, system that was defined by Lee et al. in 2019. Clinically, this is there's really prominent language dysfunction and speech abnormalities, and that's why we tend to uh, incorporate this into our testing strategy for these patients. And there will be a small proportion of patients who will have a delayed ICANS at more than three weeks. And again, that feeds into our guidance for the family members um, and the patient themselves in terms of when they go home, 
what the signs and symptoms are that they should be looking out for and when to report back um, if this should occur to them. Uh, the kind of BCMA cars, it's very interesting when we start to look at different targets, we start to see different syndromes emerging. And with the, the, the Cartitude study has reported some quite atypical neurologic symptoms, so movement and neurocognitive disorders, nerve palsies and so on, that don't seem to be temporarily associated with, with CRS. It seems to be a later onset median around about the month one time point, and it takes a bit longer to resolve. So as we sort of push this technology, this party technology further, we begin to see maybe some unexpected toxicities driven pardon me, by the cars, and we have to be very open-minded um, and consider all of these things um, as potentially car-related. Now, in terms of risk factors for high-grade ICANs, this is our difficult-to-manage syndrome. We know that CD28 Zeta CAR T-cell products can be um, more strongly associated with this syndrome, high-grade syndrome, higher doses of CAR, higher disease burden, pre-existing neurologic compromise, etc. And actually a high fever of 38.9 degrees with hemodynamic instability within 36 hours of your CAR T infusion is very sensitive at predicting for a severe ICANN syndrome. So again, watching those patients closely, perhaps intervening earlier, et cetera, because we recognize that it, 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 it is a recognized um, complication. So management, it's supportive for grade one ICANs, but corticosteroids with a rapid taper should be instituted for grade two ICANs or more. And there's no clear rule for tocilizumab and ICANs. And in fact, it may even make it worse by pushing up the IL-6, um, which can then cross the blood-brain barrier and into the brain. Now, practical priorities for clinicians. This is um, a, a tricky bit. So for progressive CRS ICANs, despite optimal use of first-line therapies, what do we do? And these are sort of some pertinent questions that were outlined by Mike Jane and team in a really nice How I Treat um, article that was published earlier this year in Blood. So let's look at them in, in turn. So can we identify patients at high risk of CRS and ICANs? Well, the truth is there are some factors associated with these syndromes. We've touched on some already. Um, we've, we've talked about the type of um, CAR T cell construct, CD28 Zeta cars, for instance, but the disease type and biology plays a role. Highly prolif proliferative and aggressive diseases, DLBCLs, BALLs, and similarly, marginal zone lymphoma and transformed mm -hmm. marginal zone lymphoma seem to be um, higher risk for these more high grade and refractory syndromes. Now, interestingly, from a biological perspective, if you look in the tumour microenvironment and you see more in the way of Tregs, well, actually, that's been shown to be associated with a reduced risk of ICANs in large B-cell lymphoma. So the biology of the disease will also play into the individual's risk. Now, in terms of disease burden, this is something we recognise. The higher the burden, the higher the cytokines, the higher the CAR-T expansion often. And that is tends to be more often correlated with severe CRS and also, unfortunately, a higher risk of CAR failure. So we sort of feel that debulking patients with bridging therapy prior to CAR should be strongly considered for all candidates and um, because it may have a sort of a knock-on beneficial impact um, on these syndromes. So and if we look about preemptive strategies, so, you know, now that we feel we can identify patients who are at high risk, is there anything we can do to prevent high-grade syndromes happening? And again, going back to a really nice table, which I urge everyone to look at, Mike, Jane and team blooded um, earlier this year. Well, they've looked at sort of strategies to, to try and prevent. So fractionated CAR T cell dosing. So this has been done um, in several centers, including our own in our BALL studies, um, but it's also been practiced at UPenn um, and also in Spain. So there are certain groups that are looking for high risk um, disorders such as BALL, fractionating the dosing to help protect the patients. Um, but prophylaxis, you can see people are trying lots of different um, approaches, tocilizumab, prophylactic dexamethasone, anakinra. Um, and, and so I guess we probably want to look a little bit uh, in a little bit of detail at these later on. Um, what about early intervention? So almost like preemptive treatment. So during low grade CRS, should we be giving these patients tocilizumab, corticosteroids? Should we be giving them um, other entities? So for instance, there's quite nice exploratory work looking at the use of ibrutinib um, and uh, itacitinib, um, which has been used by Matt Frigo and his team over um, in Boston. And they're running a prospective study looking at the impact of, 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 of blocking Jack on, on the incidence of high grade um, immunotoxicity. So it's going to be a very interesting time um, for CAR T immunotoxicity research to see the outcomes of these 
um, interesting studies. Now, in terms of prophylactic steroids, I think we're all familiar with this piece of work where really the, the investigators in Zuma 1 identified the high incidence of grade three and four ICANS events and really wanted to sort of intervene, see whether intervention could reduce the burden of that toxicity. So this manifested as cohort six. And on cohort six of Zuma 1, um, patients were um, able to get prophylactic steroids and earlier intervention with steroid and tocilizumab for low grade immunotoxicity. So how this manifested, the patients got 10 milligrams of once daily dexamethasone on day zero to day two. So you're getting that initial quite high CAR T cell expansion um, in conjunction with this sort of early intervention at grade one toxicity with tocilizumab and further steroids. And so how did that play out? Well, actually the CRS incidence was really quite impressive. So whilst less than or equal to grade two events did happen and affected 80% of patients, there were no grade three events in this um, reported cohort. The neurotoxicity, it was still a problem. 58% of patients were affected, but high grade events were definitely reduced compared to cohorts one and two at 13%. And importantly, this intervention with them, early TOSI, early DEX and the prophylactic approach, it didn't seem to impact upon your overall response rates and CR rates, because you can see the Kaplan-Meier here, it looks like those responses are, are very respectable. So I think, you know, this is obviously a feasible and a safe thing to do and potentially impacts upon the sort of the, how easy it might be to give AxiCell to particularly to older patients and high burden disease patients. The big criticism of this study is that in terms of disease burden matching, the cohort six may have had a lower disease burden than one and two. And as a consequence, the benefit of this intervention, it may not necessarily be solely the intervention. It may be that these were better risk patients for want of a better way to describe it. So let's think a little bit about BALL now. Let's think about preemptive tocilizumab with Tisicel. Um, and this was a nice evaluation led by Kaduke um, and team again over at CHOP, looking at risk adapted preemptive tocilizumab in preventing severe CRS. So you've got your children with BALL, they're due to be treated with CTL-019. They were categorized at the outset with high or low tumor burden based on the bone marrow blast percentage. And the high tumor burden patients received a single dose of tocilizumab. Um, that was after development of a high or prolonged fever. The low tumor burden group just received standard CRS management. And the primary endpoint was the frequency of grade four CRS. Now, interestingly, in the high tumor burden cohort, the incidence of grade four CRS, and this is using the UPenn scale, was 27%. And that compares pretty favorably to what was reported in the original studies, which was 50%. Um, and it didn't seem to compromise the overall response. The best overall response was 87% in the high tumor burden group. Um, and in fact, the initial um, CTL-019 expansion was, was higher in the high tumor burden group. The persistence wasn't different. So it doesn't seem to be negatively impacted upon the kind of markers we use for efficacy of the treatment. So in a sense, this sort of risk-adapted TOSI administration actually resulted in a, in a, in a reduction um, in the grade 4 CRS events, and it didn't seem to um, affect the anti-tumor efficacy or safety of CTL-019. So maybe this is the sort of thing that we should be looking at implementing more broadly, or at least testing more broadly in their patient cohorts also. So imagine the scenario, we've been through tocilizumab, we've been through steroids, our patients are still really ill. What can we do for persistent progressive CRS and ICANS that doesn't respond? So lots of different groups looking at lots of different approaches, often sort of single arm intervention studies, which again makes it harder for us to really fully interpret the results. But this is quite a nice paper that's been published by Verley and team, looking at Anna Kinra for steroid refractory um, ICANS, and it's a single center. Um, experience and they treated uh, 14 patients uh, with three daily doses um, for refractory eye counts and CRS after Tisicel or AxiCell. And what was nice to see here was that, um, you know, there was a rapid reduction in CRS and um, cytokines and the biomarkers for eye counts and CRS without necessarily an impact on the, um, the, 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 the incidence of infection, for instance, which would have been a concern because it's obviously a side effect we recognize. But what didn't work? Well, it didn't have a clear impact on neurotoxicity and it didn't really result in a rapid tapering of corticosteroids. So I think from this, we can conclude that the rule of Anakin is still unclear. It may be a possible adjunct to um, tocilizumab and steroid refractory ICANs, 
but actually it may have more of a role of uh, in, in prophylaxis and i think that's going to be the next thing that really needs to be tested um, and, and those studies are obviously ongoing those prophylactic anakinra studies now what about the dosing of anakinra is this important so a uh, nice um, paper again by Gazoo and team and it's really mainly led by the fred hutch with um, some involvement from um valderbron um, and the primary objective of this study was to look at the safety of anakinra in relapsed and refractory CRS and ICANS. And they wanted also to explore the impact on the time from anakinra to resolution of those syndromes and also the TRM. And it was a multi-center retrospective analysis. They looked at 43 patients who received CD19 or BCMA CAR products treated with anakinra. Um, and the indications for the anakinra treatment in this, co in, the, in this group of patients, if you had a grade two ICANS, which was worsening or wasn't improving with corticosteroids, or if you had a grade two CRS, again, with worsening symptoms, despite TOSI, most of the patients had the grade two ICANS, as you can see, with 40 out of the 43 patients being in this particular cohort. And what does high dose anakinra mean? Well, in this particular study that was defined as more than 200 milligrams per day IV and 28 of the patients received that dose. Now, if we want to look at the individual treatment courses categorized by anakinra dose, you can see this um, schema here is, 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 is trying to show us that effectively the, the groups were pretty well matched. So there wasn't really a difference between the high dose and the low dose anakinra groups in terms of peak CRS or peak ICANS or duration of steroid or even cumulative dose of steroid, um, the significant difference really came when you looked at the anakinra dose, which obviously stands to reason. Um, and in terms of the results, well, what was the difference in, in the dosing? Did the dosing make a difference to these patients? Well, they concluded that anakinra treatment was feasible and it was safe. It was only discontinued um, due to side effects in three patients, that's 7% of the total cohort. The overall response rate to CAR T therapy was very respectable at 77%. But when they looked at the cumulative treatment related mortality at day 28, for the whole cohort, it was 7%. But when you look at the high dose Anakin cohort, it was 0%. So for whatever reason, this cohort, you know, in that first 28 days, they, there was, they didn't succumb to their um, immunotoxicity or other um, problem. Whereas in the low dose anakinra cohort, the, the mortality was really, the treatment related mortality was, was, was high. Um, and when they looked at this in more detail, um, they, they, they thought that the TRM advantage was still, um, still stood despite age of the patient. You correct it for age, correct it for product, correct it for ferritin, correct it for performance status and so on. So, you know, the kind of conclusion here was that this is actually like a real um, anakinra driven phenomenon. Um, and I think when they looked at the sort of resolution of the CRS and ICANS in relation to when the anakinra was initiated, well, they were able to show that that was seven days in the high dose anakinra group, but for low dose anakinra, it wasn't reached. And that was mainly due to the high TRM that was observed. And these graphs just reflect what we've just discussed. You know, the anakinra dose, at the high dosing, you can see that the TRM was zero. Obviously, with the low dosing, that, 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 was, that was pretty high. Um, and the time to resolution of CRS and ICANS, you can see on the high dose, usually and most patients had responded um, within that first sort of um, essentially 28 days, it sort of resolved to, to, to normal, whereas it wasn't possible to make that conclusion in the low dose anakinra cohort because of the, 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 the TRM. So if you had to conclude, well, it seems that anakinra um, was safe for these refractory cases, and up to quite higher doses than would usually be, 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 um, be, be um, implemented in clinical practice. Um, and the overall response rate was still 77%, despite the anakinra suggesting that, you know, the, the anakinra isn't sort of overtly compromising um, the CAR T cell efficiency. The higher anakinra dose might be associated with faster resolution of your CRS and ICANS events. And it seemed to be independently associated with a lower TRM. But I think, you know, this is the first foray into this as a, you know, an exploratory piece, the dosing of anakinra. We do need more information on how potent that is. And prospective comparative studies will be really important to look into this in more detail and to help guide management of these really complex patients. And let's go a little bit more exploratory still. So anakinra, of course, is quite well defined. We've got quite a lot of experience with it now. But what about other drugs that modulate um, T-cell signaling? For instance, to satin the TKI. 
And um, again, I really like um, Evan Weber's work, and this is a lovely paper published in 2019 in Blood Advances, looking at desatinib as a modality to reversibly suppress T-cell activation. And so they did some nice preclinical work here. You can see on the left-hand side of the slide, you've got um, a mouse model. This is a leukemia mouse model, uh, an immunocompromised system with a NAM6 tumor that expresses luciferin. Um, so you can detect the, the, the tumor burden by um, bioluminescence. And you can see um, on the very left-hand side, you've got the mock cells. This is just normal um, the T cells, which obviously don't fight the tumor. And as a consequence, these mice have got a lot of disease by day 14. In the middle um, column there, you can see that when you give a nice CD19 car, it eradicates the tumor beautifully and the mice are tumor free by day 14. But when you give that car with desatinib from the get go, you can see how it, the desatinib completely reverses the beneficial impact of the car. It switches the car off. And this is borne out really nicely on the right hand side of the slide where you look at this panel of cytokines and the red dots indicate this, the, the, the desatinib group and you can see the desatinib is essentially just switching off cytokine production in these CAR T cells. And the, on the bottom of the slide, this is the really nice bit, is where it, you, you, you can demonstrate the reversibility of this phenomenon. So if you co-culture your, um, uh, your, your CAR T cells with the, um, the, the target cells and you have them co-cultured with desatinib and then you take the desatinib away, well, on the right hand side, you can see what happens. So your car, if you take the desatinib away, um, and that's the, 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 the group that's called vehicle in the blue, you can see that actually the tumor just doesn't grow. So, you know, the, the, the tumor just is, is controlled by the car. But if you keep that desatinib going, um, you can see that the tumor outgrows. I mean, it's, it's just it enormously outgrows compared to the control condition. So this is really nice. This is a reversible suppression. Um, of your CAR T cell cytotoxicity. And again, we just really look forward to trying these approaches in the clinic. There's very little clinical data now, but it's absolutely ripe for exploration, perhaps as an adjunct to management of severe syndromes or perhaps as a prophylactic strategy. And the same goes for ruxolitinib. Again, this is a beautiful drug because it has an impact not just on the T cells, but also on the myeloid compartment. And we know that the myeloid compartment plays such a big role in the, the, the sort of pathophysiology of, of your ICANN syndromes and also your HLH syndromes. And this is a preclinical piece, again, looking at whether ruxolitinib um, has any potential in this space. And on the top left um, part of this slide, what this is showing us is that ruxolitinib um, gives a dose-dependent reduction in CAR T cell cytokine secretion to effectively switching off some of their effector functions. But the, on the right hand side at the top of the slide, what it's showing us is that despite the fact that these cars that are um, inhibited to some extent by ruxolitinib, they're not making as much cytokines, they're still able to reject tumor. So that's an important part of this particular strategy. And on the bottom of the slide, this is trying to understand the biology of how this is happening, which compartments are really being inhibited by the ruxolitinib. And so they've sort of subdivided these um, the, in, into three cohorts here with the ruxolitinib, where group A has CAR T plus PBMCs, um, and they don't have any ruxolitinib. You've got group B, where they've got the CAR Ts and they've got the PBMCs exposed to the ruxolitinib, i.e. the ruxolitinib is inhibiting the monocyte compartment in that group. And then in group C, you've got the CAR T plus the PBMCs all exposed to ruxolitinib. And what this is trying to show us is that ruxolitinib impacts your cytokine secretion via both pathways, not just your CAR-T, but also your endogenous compartments. So it feels like ruxolitinib, you know, given the fact it can intervene and can switch off your myeloid compartment, that might be the key of managing the steroid and uh, tocilizumab refractory syndrome. So this, again, is a piece that really needs to be explored in the clinic. There's not that much out there. Um, there's a case report that I've showed here where ruxolitinib was used alongside methylprednisolone and uh, you know, the, the team here they are looking at a dual targeting bispecific CAR T for BALL, high disease burden, obviously high risk for immunotoxicity. But what they're showing is that at 10 milligrams BD, um, the ruxolitinib alongside the steroids managed to sort of turn this, this, this syndrome off. So lots of potential. And we look to Matt Frigo to report out on his um, JAK inhibitor study. Um, which is used in the prophylactic setting, we, we look forward to hearing the results from that in the near future.
So let's think about this. These patients are on a lot of immunosuppressive treatment. Their CAR T cells are very highly activated. Their endogenous compartment is very highly activated. This is a group of patients who are very high risk um, for, for infectious complications. And again, let's refer back to Mike Jane's paper published in Blood, where they give us some really nice guidance on supportive care measures that we should be implementing for our patients with severe and refractory CRS or ICANS. Of course, there's the neurologic um, side of things and the immune and hematologic considerations. And Marianne Subclee and um, Kai Rajewski have got a beautiful piece on hematotoxicity that I'm sure they'll be discussing in this meeting. But infectious disease, prophylactic antimicrobials are absolutely key here um, and uh, antivirals also. And really having a good close relationship with your microbiology team and getting their guidance and input um, is extremely helpful in managing these patients. And I draw attention to this syndrome of cold sepsis while patients are on steroid other agents where you get these sudden sort of hemodynamic changes without the sort of um, the prelude of fever and it can take you very much by surprise. So we need to be aware of this as a, syn a syndrome that happens in these patients that can be lethal. Um, so just if we had to sort of summarize, where are we at in this complex and fascinating field? Well, of course, you know, we're trying alongside um, Anna Sarida at Al to keep the guidelines, um, you know, best practice guidelines coming so that we can all um, be um, essentially be practicing the same medicine in, the, in, in, in this ever changing, um, ever, ever changing field of CAR -P. Um, But of course, in terms of um, steroid refractory cases, the data is limited. Um, but we do, there is some, there are some early signs that prophylaxis and early treatment of CRS may help to prevent severe toxicity. It's difficult because the single arm trials are quite challenging to interpret um, and, and caution is urged. So we probably need bigger scale studies with control arms and so on. And I can't emphasize enough how important supportive care is to the safe management of these patients and the high tumor burden raised inflammatory markers the consequences of cytopenias and infections cannot be understated um, and biomark to predict per response to standard crs and icans interventions would be really helpful in this setting um, and to date there aren't any really sort of reproducible um, assays that, that that can guide us here but i think that's a sort of an area of, of research that really is uh, would be would be welcomed so with that, thank you very much for listening. Um, I hope that's been helpful. And if there's any questions, I'd be absolutely delighted to take them.